Morning, everyone. You're on Bound for Glory on Sin. I'm um, George, fellas. Joycey here. Yeah, Matt Marston. How are we going? Joe. And I'm Peter. And we have a pretty good show today, don't we, guys? Pretty good show, yeah. yeah Jake Bachelor from the Richmond Football Club coming up today as well. Warney from DT Talk. Yeah, it's pretty fun. And we're going to talk. We're going to start off by talking about the game last night. It was a massive game, really, especially considering it was a grand final rematch. Although you have a look at the ladder, it didn't look as big as it was, I guess. But it was a massive finish. Yeah, it was. A, it was a good quality game. Um, sort of gripping throughout and a few contentious free kicks that a uh, few supporters are a bit annoyed about. We'll get straight on to that, that big one at the end, that um, that 50 metre penalty for holding the man after the mark against, it was Josh, against Josh Hunt, Hunt on, on yeah, um, the shocker Solo, night. On Alex for Solo. Now what do, we, what do we think about that decision? We see that happen so many times throughout a game, why was that one paid? No, it was there, I think. It was definitely there, but it should be paid every other time it happens yeah. as well. Well, I, I didn't really pay attention to all of the no no for, like <laughs> yeah. no no the the previous ones I'm not sure if it happened throughout but in other rounds and other matches I see that paid all the that's, time. That's but the thing is that kind of thing happens about uh, you could you could you could pick up uh, basically every mark the defender their job is to if they concede the mark is they hold up the man they hold, either hold them in position so that they can't run off or give the handball off and then they just release and the guy goes back and has his shot. I don't think there's a problem in holding them up but he actually grabbed the jumper mm. and I think that was what did it. But that's because he he, he went to go off his mark. Yeah, like that's, of, he yeah. had to do something to stop it because if he didn't, Pendlebury would have strolled into an open goal and, you know... Which he did about home. a minute later. Which, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pendlebury. <laughs> but, um, yeah, like, I mean, I don't really like the 50s as such because I think they're sort of a bit... They, they Over the last couple of years, they've been a bit sort of quick to pay mm. them. I, I think it was generally... Uh, conceived as a little bit soft but it was there mm. so and not to take anything away from Collingwood it was a big win for Collingwood and they really needed one of those those big scalps but they lost every single one of the major <laughs> stat major statistics they had less scoring shots less contested marks less free kicks less inside 50s less marks inside 50 less hit outs and less tackles so you're telling me if Geelong kicked straight they would have won basically oh, yeah. it was Geelong's game was they it had five a- behind in a row Something like that, yeah. yeah. They had 18 behinds for the night. They had the game won in the last quarter and they decided to take the foot off the pedal. And all Collingwood, well done to them. You know, they took advantage of it. How about um, Steel Sidebottom? He's really oh. flourished as a player the last couple of weeks. Yeah, 38 disposals as well. He's really, um, I think the loss of balls really helped him come up into mm. his own. Yeah, we love front bum here at uh, SEM. And su- super coach wise, I was pretty happy I had him from the start. So. Yes, <laughs> very, very good acquisition yep. there. Can we say Geelong's era is over now? Yes, or? I'd say now. Yes. Mm, yeah, not as dominant. Like, they're going to make finals, I reckon. Top pretty. four? Mm, no. no, they they're gonna struggle. Like with, with, with the teams that are up there and the teams yeah. that still need to come up there, you'd you'd really you wouldn't think about it. And Collingwood were up in the top four after that win last night as well. So yeah, yeah that adds four, another element. Yeah, yeah. top four. Oh, yeah, four at the moment. No Carlton and yeah, Sydney will overtake yeah. us, but yeah, that's yeah. if yeah. Carlton and Sydney win. I mean, it, Sydney you'd probably mark down as a win. Yeah. yeah. I mean, can you really even guarantee that Geelong will make the eight this year? I mean, with future Hall of Fame teams like Richmond yeah. coming through, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, it might be a bit oh. tough. I'm not so sure that they can make the top eight. I think they'll be, you know, thereabouts, but I don't think that um, they've got the ability to manage their list with, uh, you know, giving players rests like they have in recent years. Well, yeah, I'm not sure. There's, a, there's a, a number of different things that could happen throughout the season. I think nobody really knows. It's a good way to ease into our uh, first segment. And I guess for me, it kind of started a couple of weeks ago on Footy Classified, and they, they had two main topics on the the. 7th of May show and they were that Essendon are now genuine premiership threats and Richmond are almost certainties to make the top eight. Um, the previous show, the media had, the previous week, excuse me, the media had been ranting and raving about how good Sydney were having gone 5-0 to start the season. Uh, they've now lost twice in consecutive weeks and dropped out of the top four and nobody said it, the same people that were saying, you know, Sydney, uh, this big team, they're going to, they might win the premiership. There's been nothing. Except from Paul Ruse, who just does not shut no, up about he's, Sydney. He's, a, he's very... Like, they, they talk about... 
about um, Geelong at some point, and he, he has to bring up Shane Mumford and how well he's yeah. doing at Sydney. And, yeah, I don't, I don't think he can cut the cord, so to speak. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, you know, uh, very much the same. Carlton have been near written off as well after they lost to St Kilda on Monday. Uh, despite still, they're, they're fourth, they're tied fourth. They've been knocked out of into fifth thanks to Collingwood winning last night. Thanks a lot, Collingwood. Uh, the record of 5-2 and two and a very healthy percentage. At the same time, Hawthorne and Geelong, uh, they both had records of 4-3 and three at the beginning of the round. Obviously, Geelong lost last night. Uh, they've struggled to start the season, and yet they're still rated as two potential premiers. Based on what? I mean, there's, there's other teams that are up there that aren't rated at all. A lot of people don't rate Fremantle as a, a chance to win the premiership. Yet Hawthorne and Geelong, who are outside the top eight, are considered to uh, massive chances to win the premiership. I don't understand it. Past form. Must yeah, be important maybe. and and potential as well. It, much yeah. like uh, Carlton just happened to Carlton, it applies to Collingwood. The Magpies they um, they've been in the last three grand finals, or a game ahead of both uh, Hawthorne and Geelong. Now two games ahead of Geelong, and uh, they've moved into the top four last night. They've only lost to Hawthorne and Carlton. When you think about, it. and they've had a near depleted list at that time. They you know they had a number of injuries, yet they still only managed to have the two losses. And we haven't heard anything from the media. It's, it's starting to spark up after last night, but not everybody rid off Collingwood at the start of the year. Nobody thought they'd be up there, and they're in the top four. And keep in mind, Collingwood haven't played Gold Coast or GWS either. They've or played Melbourne. Or yeah. Melbourne, there you go. Mm. Uh, revisiting the Richmond topic, they are by no means certain is to finish in the top eight at all. Uh, they're currently 12th, two wins out of the top eight due to their low percentage, and have Geelong, <laughs> Hawthorne, and North Melbourne ahead of them. <laughs> Don't have a low percentage. It's the first time we've been above 100 in, like, in comparison, yeah, but in comparison to the teams ahead of them, they've got the lowest percentage. Um, yeah, so they've, yeah, they've got Geelong, Hawthorne and North Melbourne all ahead of them on the ladder, all of which will be pushing hard for those top eight spots. And if you're pre- prepared to tell me that Richmond are certain to finish in the top eight with those quality teams ahead of me, you're an extremely brave person because I, I don't see it happening with those players, with those teams ahead of them. It, it just shows a massive lack of accountability in journalism. It seems like every journalist wants to be the guy that predicts the thing to happen first and say, oh, well, I said this at the start of the year. And if it doesn't go that way, they kind of they, they sweep it under the rug and just kind of pretend it doesn't happen. If you're going to be bold and make a big statement, you need to be prepared to back it up. And we just don't see that. It, it's, it's frustrating as well. We have seven completed rounds into the season and West Coast, Essendon, Adelaide, Carlton, Hawthorne, Geelong, Sydney and Collingwood have all been named probable premierships, uh, premiership pl- uh, teams at one stage or another. If you're going to make a prediction, just stick with it. Don't chop and change on a weekly basis because that's horrible journalism. Mm. Um, making a prediction now, are Richmond Premiership favourites after we thump Essendon at the Dreamtime game time? <laughs> the thing is, that's, that's, that we'll get into it a bit later, but look, it's if they win... That's three on the trot, isn't it? Yeah. The, but uh, you just don't know. Against Port of Way, like, yeah, but Port, yeah. and Sydney in Melbourne with our Goods and Mumford. So it's kind of, yeah, I wouldn't say we're certainties for the eight, especially with teams like Adelaide and North getting, you know, given finals on a plate. Um, but yeah. Guys, what do we think about the lack of accountability in journalism? We're talking about it quite a lot on this show. Yeah, look, I completely agree with you, Matty. Um, I think that. Almost every week we're hearing about a new potential premiership threat and teams like Adelaide who have had, you know, soft draws so far, um, they're just, you know, they're being talked up and, you know, they've, they've won some games that they've, you know, weren't expected to win. But I just really, every week there's just a new, just a hot topic, really. I think people just love jumping on the bandwagon, mm. like just being a part of the team. Yeah, especially Could- Hawthorne fans. <laughs> and Richmond. Well, St Kilda oh, on big footy is pretty bad. As I said before, I, I feel like it's a lot of people just wanting to be able to get that first, that to be the first person to say that, I think this person's going to win the premiership. Oh, wait, it's not going to look that way. Brush it under the rug. Didn't Mike Sheehan say Melbourne was set for a dynasty? I remember him saying that. Uh, look, <laughs> we can just <laughs> chuckle at that sort of comment yeah. as well. <laughs> so, look, yeah, we're going to go to some sin messages. Sin Radio. It's time for a Panorama FYI. What is concentration of media ownership? Concentration of media ownership refers to the growing trend whereby more media outlets, such as newspapers, radio stations, websites and TV channels, are controlled by fewer individuals or organisations. In Australia, we have one of the most concentrated media sectors in the world. Looking at print alone, 11 of the 12 capital city daily newspapers are owned by only two companies. Get informed. Listen to Panorama 4.30 every weekday on SIN. 
or head to sin.org.au forward slash panorama. Klingan pub, we hotchpu e, which cup dach mutai, which is ochnis. The Klingonian ambassador would like you to know that he has a live cat in his pants. Ji kup, but ji. And he enjoys it. Povam, wab, jab, bi, it ah, we lap. Dach, 90.7, duck, che, li. The Klingonian ambassador would like to add that you should listen to The Sci Fi Hiker's Guide to the Galaxy, available on Sin 90.7 from 3 pm until 4. That, or. Okay, I'll be completely honest, I have no idea what this guy's saying. Kapwa! Film. Literature. Theatre. Interpretive dance. Installation art. Ballet. Opera. Visual art. Origami. Cabaret. Beat poetry. Street art. Mime. Puppetry. Burlesque. Baroque. Arts Bin. Sin's Youth Sunday Arts Program. 4pm Sundays on Sin. Alright, you're back on Bound for Glory on Sin. Uh, We've got Warney here from DT Talk. Uh... Ask him a few questions, uh, seven rounds into the season. What's up, Warney? Hey, how we going, guys? Yeah, not too bad, Warney. How about yourself? Yeah, not too bad. Beautiful. Heading down to um, the Hawks and Dockers game this afternoon, so that should be beautiful. All right. Um, look, obviously, looking at last night, uh, big uh, concerns over Dane Swan. Uh, what do you think uh, potential uh, choices are with him? Yeah, well, um, the trade is pretty much on the cards, mainly because um, they've got the buy there in round 12, so it's only three weeks until then. Um, and in those, two of those games are against Melbourne and Gold Coast, so I wouldn't be surprised if they put him on ice and maybe even on that play to Arizona again. But, um, yeah, I reckon that we'll be, we'll be trading. And for me, it might be a little funny one because I've gone from um, Ablett to Swan, and I might go back to Ablett with that. But we work out all right because of the... Uh, the money side of things. Look, obviously with the, having to trade sideways for injured premiums, um, how many trades do you reckon you should have left at this stage of the season? Well, I'm currently on 17 at the moment, um, and I think that's about about where we should be because we have had quite a few injuries. Um, I've heard of a couple of people, a couple of people are sitting around um, 19, 20, and so they're probably in a really good position with that. One of my mates who's in the top hundred, he um, um, he's got 19 trades left, so he's in a pretty good position with that, and so he can afford some of these sideways injury trade things. So it's sort of a no-brainer for him to go straight straight from Swanee to someone else. Um, do you think there's any mid prices to keep your eye on at the moment? Obviously, there was plenty at the start of the year who have caught our eyes. Uh, is there any coming in halfway through the season? Um, yeah, I guess there could be. The best way to look at it is fallen premiums that um, we might be able to prove. For example, I'm thinking um, after round 11 buy, uh, guys like Tom Rockcliffe and Matt Critters, they have a round 11 buy and they've got pretty huge break evens at the moment. I think we might be able to find them pretty cheap over a couple of weeks like when, when they have their buy. So that'd be great to look to upgrade to. All right. Um, what do you reckon, what's your uh, best strategy to survive the buy rounds? Uh, because then. Imagine, you know, if that happened the week before, um, the week before his buy, and so we miss him for a week, and then um, all those sorts of things, because at the moment, we'll all be probably copping one or two donuts the way it's going, so um, my strategy from the start of the year, and a lot of people did set their teams up like this, is to spread their players across each line, across the buys, so mine's looking pretty good with that, but every time, you know, you're looking for some downgrade targets, and all that sort of thing, it it messes around with it, and so, you know, an injury or two there can change the structure of your team a bit, and and it's been really sad and really hard to try to... um, to try to make your team, keep your team structure when there's been injuries like that. For example, today or like yesterday, this week I um, would have liked to have gone Ellis down to Spur, but it just really messed around with my buy structure. So um, yeah, that sort of you know those sort of worries get in the way for that. Uh, um, speaking of downgrades for the rest of the season, obviously we've had uh, Horsley, Adams, um, Trelaw coming through in the recent. Weeks. Uh, is there any more GWS or Gold Coast players to look out for the rest of the season? Yeah, probably GWS are going to be where we're going to find most of our guys. Um, 
Uh, Sam Daly gets his first game this week, and I think he would be a great option to get in because he has had some decent junior numbers. Um, I think his horn's been pretty good in the Magoos, so he's definitely one to look at this week, see how he, see how he plays. Uh, also, Miles, Anthony Miles, played one game a couple of weeks ago. Um, hasn't got a gig again yet, but he may be a chance to come in. But there are a few guys I guess we need to keep our eye on. Thing is, job security for a lot of a lot of them probably isn't that high because they'll be rotated a lot. So um, I'm sure that we'll find we'll find a few. And we're still waiting on our mate to get off the couch at Melbourne. Tom Couch, we'd love to see him soon. I reckon. Yeah, and um, with the players that are getting a game this week, like Darley, for example, um, they're really coming in for you know more of the. I guess you can say experienced players like Bug, Shield, and Smith. So you can't really um, say that they have a lot of job security. Oh, definitely not. Definitely not. So that's um, that's where we've got to see. But I think as we'll see with GWS, they'll rotate around a lot, like you would have thought that um, Joel McDonald, uh, James McDonald, sorry, would have um, been back this week. So um, after having one week on the sideline, so you know anything can happen with them, and they'll they'll be just managing their players the best that they can. And um, for the rest of the season, maybe even just straight after the buys, um, what would you say were your three choice picks to pick up, ones that have probably bottomed out in price premiums or are set to really soar um, in the coming weeks? Yeah, I think um, there's quite a few guys that you can really look at. Um, looking at the buys, you know, try to, the strategy that I was talking about before was picking up a player after they've had their buy. So you might, whether it's a sideways trade or an upgrade trade, like, I don't know, Kyle Horsley might be a perfect one there we can talk about. He has a round 13 buy, um, so he's going to get pretty close to his max price at that stage, the way he's going, although I think we'd probably be smart if he keeps doing this, we'll keep him. But if you were looking at upgrading him, upgrade him before round 13, so just before the round 13, but getting a player that's been a round 12 or a round 11 player, so then you're sort of avoiding a zero there, but also bolstering your team with that. So some cash in the bank would be quite handy. Um, guys around there, I think there's a few people that, and one of those is the guy that I have, Bryce Gibbs, I think he'll be in for a good second half of the season because he started off very, very slowly. Um, so he'd be one that would be a great upgrade target at the moment, I think, after the buys. Um, obviously, uh, with Sandy and uh, Mumford and McAvoy all going down with injuries at some point during the season, um, we haven't really had a lot of stable rock options besides like Giles, Cox and Ryder, really. Um, do you have any rock alternatives or strategies for the rest of the year? Yeah, so that's been amazing. It's really hard. A lot of people started with the one premium and the three rookie ruck system. Um, this week, we were very, very lucky. Um, I'm a HMAC owner. I went from month to HMAC, so that sort of was a little bit of a worry. But, um, but we're lucky to get Orange Stevenson in. So we had a nice 70 odd last night, which, which was, you know, someone sent me a message that we were kissed on the proverbial about that. But, um, we can, yeah, we can be pretty happy with those sorts of things. But I think, Looking ahead, we're just going to have to hold tight and we might, and a ruck is probably a good line or a line that we can wear a donut in. Like I, for I to make it Josh, you know, one or two weeks, it might have been one or two weeks worth of a donut for me to wait for that. Um, because there has been so much carnage, I think without thinking until after the buys, you probably just hold what you can there at the moment. All right. Uh, when are you coming to Melbourne, Warney? Um, oh, hopefully over in, um, we've got our, we're teachers, so in our school holidays in a couple of weeks' time, we'll probably get a little bit of a trip over. Um, got a couple of little projects on the go at the moment, so fingers crossed that they can come to fruition around that time, and we'll, um, we'll be looking good, and we might be a little bit of a bigger and better DC talk in a few weeks' time, which will be great. Yeah, we'll have to have you on the show live. Uh, well, that'd be awesome. Yep. All right. So, so we'll see you soon, and, uh, Thanks very much for coming on. No worries. Cheers, guys. Good luck this weekend. You too. Well, you're listening to Bound for Glory. If you want to text in on 0427-767-767, we'd love to hear anything you want to talk about footy. So basically, last Monday I was given free tickets to one of our, from one of our co-partners in Kit Harvey to see the Blues take on St Kilda. Thought oh, it could be a good opportunity to see the Blues beat St Kilda, but I was wrong. Uh, Ahmed Syed and Terry Malira, the two mature age recruits for St Kilda, were fantastic. They just weaved and dodged their 
play around opponents and play uh, brilliantly. Add Melbourne to that and you've got a dynamic tripod of quality small forwards. As most people know, hate Milm, and I've booed him on many occasions, and I agree most of here, he was, he was great. The abuse he cops on the sidelines is a bit unfair, but but he just he lifts for the occasion. I know he hasn't played uh, played big in grand finals, but he he dominated on on Monday night. It was just superb, and it was great seeing uh, the the flack that he gave Joseph after he uh, dropped that mark. It was it was very entertaining. The enthusiasm and pressure Saad and Milne brought to the contest lifted their counterparts. I I've never seen St Kilda supporters get so rowdy and into the game with the pressure they put on. The quality small men in Garlet and Betts and Yaron weren't weren't present. Ga- Yaron wasn't playing, but Garlet Garlet didn't do much and Betts kicked some freakish goals, but it, that's Betts for you. If you look all at all the other teams, they have small forwards, but there's no tripod like the Saints. After seven rounds, we only have one goal kicker over 20 goals. So it looks like the days of the big power forward are finished. No Lockett, no Carey dominating. The Saints tripod seems to be the only way to kick lots of goals by sharing the load. And most teams don't have three quality small defenders, so defending is going to be really hard. Is there is this the new secret weapon in the AFL? I wouldn't say that, that just before we get, I wouldn't say that power forwards have, are, um, are gone and dead, honestly, because you still got... Cloak, Travis Cloak's probably still most the Dean most dangerous player in the AFL. Lance Franklin's still up there. Josh Kennedy is having an average season. But on topic, yeah, it, teams that have small forwards, they are extremely damaging because most teams don't know how to deal with it. You prepare to, when you think of, of forward lines, you think the big forwards to kick the majority of the goals and the small guys to chip in with one or two. Not for them to kick the majority of the goals. I think uh, Milne, Saad, and the other bloke, I can't think of his name, Malaris. sorry, Malaric, excuse me, they shared in nine goals on Monday, I think. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I definitely don't think Carlton were expecting that. But, look, teams that have that um, that strategy, it works for a while. I think teams do, other teams do pick up on it, but... Um, as far as, as getting goals, it's certainly something that's that's new that teams don't really know how to deal with. But with, like, I know what you mean, but with the power forward, I think the days of 100-goal kickers are... Oh, finished. definitely. Yeah, you, you, we're honestly going to be... I think that also is a credit to the, the quality of defenders that we have at the moment, as well as t- uh, tactics and stuff like that with defensive presses and all that sort of thing. But, yeah, as, as um, I definitely agree that, that small forwards... Uh, a lot more hard to predict, I guess. And when you have three or four of them down there, you've got three or four blokes that you just don't know what they're going to do. A- apart from St Kilda and Carlton, is there any other team that's got three quality small forwards? Three quality small forwards? I, I'm not quite sure. There are teams that have some, some magnificent small forwards, but they also have a few mid-sized uh, forwards as well. So I guess they don't, really, they don't really play the role of small forwards, so no. I'm not showing any bias, but in recent weeks, both uh, Alwyn Davey and Leroy Jetta have put on quite a show. I've been averaging maybe two or three goals in the past few weeks. So I would agree that whilst uh, perhaps the big key forwards aren't kicking as many goals, there is you know a, a more need for uh, small forwards to start kicking more goals. And I last last point, I want to ask you boys this: Is Stephen Milne the greatest small forward in the modern century? Yes. Currently, yes. Oh, Kevin Bartlett would be up there. Yeah, Bartlett's up there. But yes, at the moment, as much as we love to hate him, he's a magnificent footballer. He kicks goals. He he doesn't always do them in finals, but he's a good footballer. We're going to pop off to some sin messages and be back with an interview with Richmond rebound defender Jake Batchelor. This is a bench warmer's profile. Brian Scalabrini, currently playing as a forward for the Chicago Bulls, is the ultimate king of bench warmers. Playing on NBA lists since 2001, he really hasn't done enough to cement himself as a starting player in the NBA. Aww. Brian has, however, achieved a kind of godlike status when he does something incredible. The crowd goes nuts. Oh, oh Scott, the white mama, don't do him like that! Brian's job on the NBA clubs of late has been more of doing stuff off of the field, 
being a huge morale boost for his supporters as well as the players on his team. He brings a sense of humor to a somewhat serious game. But in five years, you guys are going to forget. In 10 years, I'll still be a champ. In 20 years, I'll tell my kids I probably started. And in 30 years, I probably told them I got the MVP. So I'm really not too worried about it. You can catch the bench warmers 9 a.m. Sundays only on Sin. Sin? Sin. Sin. Bound for glory on Sin. Um, just text us in on 0427 767 767. We love to hear your thoughts about uh, small forwards. And Stephen Milne, is he the greatest small forward of all time? It's a free text too, so might as well. Uh, we're going to try kick off to an interview with uh, Tigers player Jack Batchelor. Yeah, it was uh, yeah first game in front of, I think, before we play in front of uh, 83,000. Um, still remember it pretty pretty well. It was... Uh, it was a very cold night. And it was a it was a great game. It was, yeah. um, no, it was it, good to see the uh, to to see Richmond get up as well. And I think uh, Reese Conker got the Rising Star nomination that week. And uh, he did, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 he seems like a bit of a character. Did he really uh, let the boys know that he got the nomination later in the week? Or no, no, he, he's a bit of a character. He definitely is that, but he's not one to. Uh, he likes to uh, keep, keep his head at, at the right level. He uh, doesn't let that stuff get to him or. He's, uh, he's just got the perfect mix of um, flamboyance, and, uh, but no, he's, uh, he knows when to, to take it easy a bit. Yeah, sure. And uh, I, I think later in the year, next time we played Essendon, you got the Rising Star nomination, isn't that right? I did, yeah. It was a bit weird. Yeah, it seems um, yeah, something so about playing the Yeah, that was uh, round 16. Um, unfortunately, we lost, that, we lost that game pretty easily, but um, yeah, kind of had a, had a not-too-bad game and got a bit of recognition for it, which was good. Yeah, sure, that was, it must have been good. Um, and obviously you can't talk specific tactics, but I'm sure uh, Essendon's key players will be getting some close attention. I mean, uh, Richmond have been playing some very accountable football lately, and I'm sure, you know, maybe more of the outside runners like Stanton and Heppel will get a, a close tag to sort of put them outside of their comfort zone and have them get the contested ball. Yeah, well, um, well, luckily I'm a, I'm a backman, so I don't have to worry about the forwards. But um, yeah, we're not taking we don't, don't take anyone lightly in the competition, especially the way Essendon have been going at the moment. they uh, they've got they've got players all around the ground that can that can dominate if we uh, if we don't play if we don't play defensively well enough. I guess they've got Watson in the middle and Hockey, and then like you said, Stanton and uh, Heppel who just who just run all day. But then they've got a real uh, potent forward line as well with uh, Hurley coming back in and. Uh, Cramery playing some real good footy, so they've just got uh, great players all around the board, and uh, we're going to need to be on our game to, uh, to top them. Yeah, it should be a great game. And uh, w- with your preseason, I noticed that you had uh, a few stints on the ball and on the wing. Um, yep. Was that to get your match fitness up, or because I understand you had a, an injury in the preseason, or was it more you're being tried for a possible future position up the ground? Yeah, I was trying. To, I was uh, originally just going to be groomed into a little bit of a, a wing halfback role. Um, I don't know. Just, just wasn't. Uh, I think I just decided a couple of after a couple of games that the back line's still the best position for me at, at this point. Um, and I'm just, yeah, just I'm happy. I'm happy to it. Just happy just to be in the team and I'll play wherever the, the uh, team needs me. If that's on the wing, if that's on uh, full back line, so be it. Yeah, I mean, personally, I love seeing you at half back. I mean, you've got some great contested marking, floating across third man, taking the mark there, but. Uh... Yeah, I think it's uh, it's it's your position. And was there any added pressure on you as a result of receiving the number of eleven, most recently worn by Joel Baden, of course? Or was that really um, more of a, a, a spur that that made you uh, you know step up your game even more? Yeah, I don't think I, I, I didn't get any more, any pressure on me. Um, definitely not from anyone around the club or anything. Um, uh, we're, we're kind of kind of the same, similar kind of players. Not exactly, but uh, both half backers and uh, play loose played loose man a bit but um no nah, no real added pressure or anything like that but it just i guess gives me a little bit of incentive to try and be half as good as what joel was that'd yeah. be nice yeah sure and um what's the feeling like in terms of the richmond back line this year i mean it seems like uh, it's a lot more settled with players like uh, alex rance and dylan grimes really stepping up um and how much of the improvement would you say as a result of uh justin lepich and ross smith i mean i know he was brought in as a you know, all ground defensive coach. So yep. it must put a lot less pressure on the back line to have the ball not uh, going in there as often. Yeah, well, that's the thing. We um, we try and we try and turn over the ball as far as, as close to our goals as possible. So uh, if, it, if we're having a good day, the ball won't come come in more than 35, 40 times. Mm. Um, but at least we uh, we're getting continuity into, into the players now. So like you said, with uh, Ranty and Grimesy, they've both been in uh, amazing form. 
um, which is hats off to them because they've, they've worked their backsides off if for uh, the pre-season and especially Grimesy coming back from that uh, hamstring injury that he did in the in the Dreamtime game last year. Yeah, I remember. Um, that. That was, he's been real yeah. diligent with the way that he's gone gone about his pre-season, and uh, they leave no stone unturned those t- uh, those two, and um, just the inclusion of. Uh, Steve Morris and Brandon Ellis in the back line just give a bit more class and toughness back into the back line. Um, we just we just got confidence in each other now. We just that, that everyone's just just is on is on the same page, I guess, and knows what we're doing, what we, what we expect of each other, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's paying it's paying off, especially with the uh, yeah same with uh, Justin Leppich and Ross Smith, their uh, their game plans, and uh, yeah, it's uh, very easy to uh, I guess to to do on the field what they do because it's uh, pretty simple stuff when you think about it so um yeah sure and uh just one last thing uh newey's 200th this week yeah. um are the boys really fired up for it or are they just treating it like any other game or i'm sure some of the louder players at the club like uh jack are, are really uh you know g'ing him up saying you know big 200th game that sort of thing yeah we're looking forward to it we're um obviously for a few reasons for the dream time and uh, especially for newey's uh 200th it's a it's a huge achievement that uh Extremely deserved on his behalf. Um, yeah, it hasn't been hasn't been heaps about it. We've had we've had a little bit of a chat about it, but uh, no, we'll probably go into more detail about it and have a little bit more of a chat about it tomorrow and then Saturday. But I think everyone just everyone knows by themselves the 22 that will play the game knows how significant the game is in for Chris and I guess the club as well for him being captain the last couple of years. And uh, yeah, look forward to do the job for him. All right. Well. Uh... That's all we've got time for, but thanks you, thank you very much for your time, Jake. Welcome back to Bound for Glory, and we've got a few SMSs coming in here, so we're going to go through them. Uh, the first one was about, the, from Strawnside, the 50-metre penalty is too harsh for incidents, like the one last night, need a 15-metre as well. What are we thoughts? I, I thought that was there, because it was a sure goal, in my yeah, opinion, the, if he didn't try and stop him. The, I, go ahead. Sorry, the call was there. I think the issue is that it, it doesn't get paid all the time. Mm. Whereas that should be really, technically, by the letter of the law, that should be paid every single time, and that's not. Yeah. Um, in terms of harsh 50-metre penalties, I think the interchange infringement is the one that's yeah. too harsh. I mean, Definitely. from a centre bound, like if it happens after a goal, then it's an immediate goal to the, the team yeah. again. So it's it's pretty ridiculous. And another one was uh, Strawnside again saying about no, nobody goes to draft or to recruit a back pocket player to play on these small forwards. So Steve a... Morris. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> That's actually ruined. a really great point by Strawnside there. We, who are the quality small defenders out there? Steve Morris. Mo- mo- <laughs> mo- most of the quality small defenders, I think, are mostly those who are running defenders. I think yeah. the small defenders who are taggers as such are more midfielders that go back and tag. Yeah. Would you such... Class- would, oh, you, yeah. would you classify Sean Dempster as a small forward, a small defender? Well, I'd say medium. Like I wouldn't. He's not. He's not he can like small on... in the sense of like height wise small. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So I mean, yeah. Um, Tuvi, I guess. He's, yeah, he's, he's another one. Yep. Um, and the other text we got was, as much as I hate to say, um, Brad Johnson's got to be up there for best small forward mm. of the modern era. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that's also the in the, in the, in the Milne know. boat where you don't really want to give him credit because he's a bit of a knob. Yeah, just someone likes him. He was very good for his team, though. He, he was. Um, and Unless he had a kick after the siren, then he was still <laughs> good for his team. And we've got, uh, for the guy who texted in saying what are our big footy usernames, we're just going to say go to the... There's oh, a fourth, a, fourth estate uh, section on big estate. footy, 44th estate. Thank you very much, Joycey. Uh Yeah, just have a look on there. You'll be able to figure out who we are. We'll talk to you later if you'd like. And for tips and help on fantasy footy, go to the Facebook page on AFL Dream Team Supercoach. Woo. Um, and the last one that was just sent in there, Greg Broughton, when he's not in the midfield. Shut down defender? Uh... Yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah, but I, mean, I hate he's, when he does it because he does terrible for my. Uh, but he's not a he's not a specialist. I don't think he, he's not drafted for the sole purpose of shutting down small forwards. True. So, all right, fellas. Look, uh, this week is an in, Indigenous round uh, where we celebrate all the um, all the brilliance that Indigenous players bring to our game. Um, obviously, dream time at the G tonight is just basically going to sum it all up. Uh, both sides have had many Indigenous stars along the journey, and currently uh, players like Jetta, Ryder, and Davey are in ripping form. Uh, Ryder has recently said uh, that he'll be—he's um, in contract negotiations right now with the Bombers and is looking to sign. 
Uh, fun fact, Richmond has just two Indigenous players on their list at the moment in Shane Edwards and Gibson Turner. Uh, Shane Edwards hasn't had a great season so far. Do Indigenous players get favouritism in Indigenous round? Should he be playing tonight? Yeah, he should be playing. I mean, he's been okay this year. He recently extended his contract until the end of 2014, I think. Um, and, I mean, he, he's really one of the whipping boys for Richmond. Um, cops a lot of flag, but he runs all day, does a great job defensively, and then sometimes he just doesn't finish off his really good work with a under a, su- a subpar kick, I'll, I'll call it. I think I'm going to have to disagree there a little bit, but uh, you always go out and play your best possible team, and if that player, whether they're an Indigenous player or not, mm. if they're not in that best team, they shouldn't be playing. It doesn't matter what round it is. Is, yeah. it, is it just a mad coincidence that Liam Jarrah's playing this week? I think it is. It, it, it's really sort of like... Uh, as far as timing timing goes, it's matched up in, with his return in um, the Indigenous round. So yeah, Melbourne needs him to be playing anyway. I don't yeah. think it's yeah. Um, former Sydney great Michael O'Loughlin has chucked his view in terms of uh, state of origin this week, uh, saying that if it is brought back, there should be an Ind- Indigenous All Star team. Uh, fellas, what are your thoughts? I, I don't think no. I don't think so. I really don't think so because it's a state of origin thing. Yeah, it's not a. Um, well, as long as they included all of this, like if they include Northern Territory in like the, was it tier two or, or whatever? Yeah, it is. I guess. Oh, you could also do what um what they do in the NRL regarding players from Melbourne and and such playing in the state of origin. Mm. But if you look at state of origin, it's really just the Vicks, South Australia, and then Western Australia. Mm. Like allies never worked, and then you can't really have a Northern Territory or. You can't have you can't have a um, an indigenous team because not all the Aboriginal players in the AFL are from the Northern Territory. They, you know, you'd be stealing players from Victoria, or you'd have Aboriginal players playing for Victoria or South Australia or, or any of those other states. So it's not really an indigenous team. See, with the um, allies on that point, there was a stage where wasn't it Buckley, Voss, Hurd, and Carey were all allies because mm. they all yeah. came from either New South Wales or Queensland. Yeah. So I think it really depends on the time. Like I mean, obviously with that kind of midfield back in that day, that could match it with the best. So mm. um, yeah, it really does depend. But obviously, there's less of a player pool that they could play with. Same with Tasmania that usually joins up there. So, yeah. but would the AFL want to say Tasmania versus allies? One. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think so. I don't think that'd be a very interesting game. <laughs> well, oh. who, who, you'd have the rewalts against each other, wouldn't you? Because Tassie against Queensland. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. So yeah. you'd have a bit of bit of interest, but not a lot. Like, um, obviously, if they want to fare up the Victoria, you'd go Vic Metro and Vic Country. Uh, yeah, maybe. I think like in the under 18s mm. uh, carnival, that how they've got the tier one and tier two with Vic Metro and Vic Country. Uh, probably evens it out a bit. Um, fellas, look, we should probably be uh, getting on to the games this weekend. Uh, first up is Port Adelaide versus North Melbourne. Going to be interesting, that's for sure. <laughs> I've got a couple of boys in here sweating uh, at the result. Um, thoughts on North the... North really, really dropped the ball last week. I mean, I can't put into words how... The, the win was on the plate for them to have, and it's one of those wins that they need to have if they're going to finish in the mm. top eight, and they didn't. Yeah, I mean, soft draw doesn't immediately get you into finals. You actually have to play north, so you might want to do that this week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, being a north supporter, what do you think about Lindsay Thomas? <laughs> he can't like, kick. Like, he just can't kick. Yeah. Is like, it time to drop unless him? Unless he's in his no, sock. Not, he can kick when he's he, got a sock on. Yeah. Oh. No, that's not time to drop him, no, because I don't think that'll do anything for his confidence. He's still playing good football. He just can't convert. Speaking of that, is does Brad Scott have a problem with Ben Warren? Because he doesn't get a game. And he's I been, think he's, he's been whipping. in good form in the yeah. VFL. Yeah, whipping boy. He's I, definitely a whipping boy. I think it's since Aaron Edwards has been dominating in that position. So make him replace Lindsay Thomas, or at <laughs> least give him a chance. But then... Scott's philosophy is Lindsay Thomas brings the pressure to the forward line is Matt Campbell isn't getting a game mm. and if you take Lindsay out you don't want all but big men in the forward what line What kind of a field kick is Thomas though because could you do the old put if him in the half back yeah, flank bring, bring, it, bring drive out of defence type mm. thing You could but his tank's not that big oh. so he's he's perfect for a small if he could kick straight yeah. he'd be leading the goal kick Tips boys who do we think will win? Uh, Port by a goal, I reckon. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go with Port as well, mm. just because North is a bad team. Port's <laughs> back in as well this week, so yeah. Port have got that forward target. But I'm going to stick with North. I think you know they had a bad week last week. I don't think they'll lose again. I think they'll be hell to pay if if they don't win this week. Scott will heads will roll. 
I think they'll bounce back. 60-point win. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I went for whichever team was at home. I think it's going to be that close. So I went with Port just. Hawthorne so. Fremantle. I think this one's being played down in Tasmania. Um, I think we can pretty much say this is going to be a bit of a snooze fest. I, I don't know. Like I remember, was it last year or the year before, um, I think Fremantle rested about 14 players when they went to Tasmania to play Hawthorne and they got absolutely demolished. Yeah. So we don't really have a, a form factor of how Fremantle play, Fremantle play in Tasmania. Um, but I'm still going for Hawthorne. Hawthorne hasn't been playing that well in Tasmania. They didn't kick it. Didn't score in the third quarter against, against Sydney. Sydney. Yeah, mm. um, big matchup uh, obviously down there is Luke McFarlane against Buddy Franklin. Boys, oh, how do you McFarlane's reckon? Been McFarlane has been playing really well. Yeah, yeah. I, think, yeah I, don't, I think it'll just be McFarlane on Franklin as well. They'll do the, the typical Fremantle will drop a lot of players back and play two on one on both the, the oh, big yeah. guys. They'll have Roughhead playing up in the midfield for most of the game, at playing ruck. You'd think, but um, look. It, that's why I mean it's going to be a bit of a snooze fest. You'd think it might be one of those games where the winner kicks 80 points, yet they still might win by five to six goals. Yeah, I keep forgetting that Ross Lyon's the coach now. Yeah. So I was like, oh, this is going to be a fairly interesting... Oh, no, wait. no, I don't think so. Yeah. Here we go for tips. Uh, Hawks. Yeah, easy. Yep. Yeah, Hawks I think easy. Hawks will have them. I yep. think that's uh, pretty unanimous. Yeah, another one is unanimous without even really even previewing it. Sydney, Melbourne. Sydney. In Sydney. Sydney. Margin. <laughs> Uh, Jarrah's back as well. 70 points. Jarrah's back. It's big for Melbourne, I guess, but it's still not enough. Yeah, I reckon probably about 35-40, only because they're still missing Mumford and Goods, so Mm. that's still too huge. They'll be very annoyed at losing to the future superstars of the competition last week, though. So So I'm sure Melbourne will be happy with their form, so Mm. they won't be angry at all. Brad Green's (laughs) back. Is this his last year? Oh, should be. Yeah. Should he's, better yeah, be. If if he's not gonna, if they don't pull the plug on him, he needs to pull the plug because he's not playing good football. That's that's just how it is. He's not playing well. Oh, this is a really good round, actually, in terms of yeah. evenness. <laughs> Western Bulldogs, Gold Coast. Uh, you'd say that on based on last week's form that uh, Bulldogs should win, and I think it is in Melbourne. Yeah. So. If it was TIO in Stadium, Darwin. Oh, Darwin. Oh, Darwin. Oh, okay. Ooh. <laughs> Gold Coast might be more used to the climate. That's the only thing. They, they Bulldogs sell a lot of their home games. Yeah, they though, do. They've so. played a lot up there, so they yeah. should. Yeah, they should win, and yeah. maybe not comfortably, but I'd say maybe two or three goals. I yeah. think that the the big key here is the Bulldogs back three: Murphy, Lake, and Hargrave. I don't think there'll be a lot of goals scored against them, to be honest. See, with the Bulldogs, it's only their forward line that really needs work because yeah, their midfield's still work. decent. Yeah, well, well Dixon obviously played really well though. Yeah, like Dixon seems to be quite decent. So, yeah, um, yeah the back line's still solid and mid field so the call's still out for Higgins to step mm. up he hasn't done it yet he still needs to step <laughs> up and, and take it because he can be a good footballer but he's 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 starting to get into that that age group where you really need this person to become a senior player and especially in the forward line they're dying for somebody to step up he's gotten a bit slow I think maybe he's lost confidence in his hamstrings because he keeps getting these soft tissue injuries yeah it does happen after you um, have a reoccurring injury I think he's a never again pick for me for Dream Team because of these injuries <laughs> look um, speaking of fantasy footy um, someone that's been on our radar and I think uh, Warney talked about him as well was Tom Couch who's been absolutely killing it in the VFL um is he going to get a game soon, fellas, for the uh, for the Ds? Who else? Why isn't he getting a game already? It's There's not just like... a lot of slow midfielders already. I think he's mm. like a pretty similar type. That they have Magna is adding couch too much. No. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I going back to what you were saying about um, Jara, Matt. Um, they dropped bait and petted, and I don't think that they were playing that badly. No, that, if if they're going to drop them on form on that game against Hawthorne the, the last week, there there really wasn't much of a chance for the forwards after quarter mm. time. Anyway, we're getting a little bit off topic. Western Bulldogs, Gold Coast. Who are we tipping? Dogs, dogs, dogs. Yeah, yeah dogs. Pretty easy. Dream time at the G game. Essendon, Richmond. I don't think this is as as easy as I guess um, the the latter would. Or the form guide might even show, I guess. Yeah, or, or the people that call into talkback radio. <laughs> um, is, is this the biggest Dreamtime game ever? Not ever, no. Not I think ever. last year's one was pretty big. Yeah, when Essendon supporters got all riled up saying, I think, oh, yeah, we're going to be top yeah. four, and then I think we, this we is, smashed them into the ground. This is big in regards to where the where the teams are at the moment. If Richmond win this, they, you'd really consider them 
to possibly finish top eight. But if they don't, mm. then it's kind of like, well, you know, who are they, how are they going to get up there? Yeah. Same as with, with Essendon in regards to top four. If they win this, you think, well, they're going to be up there. If they lose this, you think, oh, well, you know, they're still, they've got, they'll have a record of six and two if they lose. It's yeah. still pretty good, but... You know, it's a big game as well. They've lost. They would have lost two big games if they go down. One being against uh, Collingwood, and this one being against Richmond. Um, big matchup this week, boys. Uh, James Hurd has responded to a question about where Hurley would be playing, and he said that he uh, potentially will get the gig on Jack Rewalt for parts of the game. Uh, who do you think is going to win that battle? As much as I hate to say it, I think Hurley will. He absolutely monstered Rewalt last time they played. Um, and Jack really hasn't been playing like his usual self. He isn't leading forward for the ball. He's really saying, kick it, and I'll try and take mark of the year every week. And, you know, that gets a bit annoying. Is Jack a better player when he he's the man no. compared to no. sharing the load? No, I don't think so at no. all. I think Jack's problem, and this is the first thing I noticed as soon as the season started. I had it kept in a close eye on Richmond because I really wanted to see how they were going this year. Uh, the first thing I realised was... A, the over-reliance on Jack Rewalt, and B, Jack's over-reliance on himself to be a show pony. He's mm. a great footballer, but the thing is, he, he as was mentioned before, he goes up for the mark of the week every single time. There was a, um, There's a lot of situations where he's two-on-one or three-on-one, and he'll go back at the back of the pack to try and get the fly, and he's instantly giving up front position, whereas if he keeps front position, he might not take the mark, but he'll bring the ball to ground and have you know those those loose Richmond players swoop in and take the ball and potentially get a shot on goal. Yep. Agreed. Tips? Uh, I'm going to say Bombers by two goals, but I reckon it'll be a massively close one. I tipped Essendon, but with no certainty whatsoever. Yep. Richmond by two goals. I had Essendon by a little bit. Richmond by yeah. 50 points. <laughs> <laughs> Pick the Richmond supporter. <laughs> Brisbane GWS, it's been pumped up in the media as a game uh, where GWS could win their second on the trot. But I think that that's pretty unfair on um, on Brisbane. They haven't been the worst. They haven't won as many games as they like, but they haven't been terrible. Did mm. Did you guys see the ladder on Big Footy without the GWS, Melbourne, and Gold Coast? No. Without those teams, like Brisbane 40%. would have a percent of forty seven percent. Well, uh, there goes everything I just. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, in saying that, I think Brisbane will still win. But yeah, it was quite interesting to see that because obviously they belted Melbourne and then beat up um, Gold Coast. And I, I remember yeah. with Brisbane playing Gold Coast, people were saying, oh, the Q clash, it's going to be really close again, and then Brisbane crushed Gold Coast. Mm. So um, I'm going to go with Brisbane, but I think GWS could win. I think um, one thing that is really intriguing for most people who you know pay attention to footy and especially um, Supercoach and Dream Team is James McDonald, once again, not uh, getting back into the team, and a lot of um, players like Devin Smith... Uh, Tom Bug just, you know, getting rested this week. Dylan Shiel. Dylan no. Shiel. Making me do trades. <laughs> um, the the rotation policy for GWS, is anyone else getting frustrated or is that just me? <laughs> that, that's shady for you, i got to say. It's just mm. shady. It's just what he does. He's a, You can't really predict what he's going to do, I guess. Mm. So right. I think oh, it's pretty unanimous we're going to go with yeah, Lions. His, Lions. the Lions. 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 Carlton Adelaide at Amy Stadium. It's going to be a big game as far as... No, no, Eddie, no, sorry, excuse Eddie me, Etihad Stadium. <laughs> Get it right, Carlton supporters. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> it's a massive game as far as the makeup of the the ladder goes with Adelaide being, I believe, equal... Their first, outright first, or outright second? I can't believe, remember. And Carlton just outside top four on percentage. I ask you this, Matt. Will David Ellard starting will start on the ground? I hope so because he's he a much like better option than Aaron Joseph. Dream Team points in he's one ma- quarter. Oh, he's a, he's another one of the boys. Jeez. He just kept just they they keep him out and he needs to be playing because mm. his best football is at top level. Well, surely they will get rid of Joseph and play Ellard. Yeah, he, he was pretty personal dismal. level. Joseph isn't very good. Mm. Yeah, just full stop. He's not very. He's good also ball. a weak blank, <laughs> according to Mill. <laughs> and Adelaide um, are missing Tex Walker is yeah. the other key thing. I think oh, I, really? I would have gone mm. with uh, Adelaide had it been a in Amy at Amy Stadium and B if Walker were playing. But with, it's just poor pleasure and and Tippett mm. and not taking anything away from them. But who's had, coming in for Walker? I'm not sure. I don't think they've That's got a. Those questions they don't have spot, a please. like for like replacement uh, for him. I think they've yeah. just gone mid. I think oh. it's Jenkins. The Sorry for interrupting. Ex- <laughs> <laughs> the ex rookie. Keep from going. <laughs> yeah, no, I think Jenkins played last yeah, week and did. played yeah. solidly. So yeah, he got 80 super yeah. coach points. Right, so tips, boys. Carlton? 
Carlton. Yeah, it's another one that yeah. I'm not certain about. They don't really Carlton. want to. C- Carlton and a close one, I think. I think Adelaide might pinch it. Go. Controversial. <laughs> uh, um, West Coast Saints uh, at Patterson. It's pretty easy for this. Yeah. I can't believe. I think West Coast are paying something like a dollar sixty to win this, and St Kilda paying two dollars, two dollars thirty, or something like that. It's going to be West Coast comfortably, surely. They've still surely. got a lot of injuries over there. They have got. They have got a but lot Nick of injuries. Back, but so. if if it was They're, in Melbourne, I think it'd be a lot closer. But. Yeah, that's yeah, that, yeah, over that's there, taking yeah. in West Coast's yeah. Saints, terrible record. Saints <laughs> don't have a ruckman. I don't think. No. Um, so Cox and Nat Nui, they should monster them. All the Chris should. is still out, isn't he? And Kaczynski's been in really good form up forward, so I don't know, like, they really should have just recalled, you know, someone else to play Ruck. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think we're all, uh, most of us will be tipping West Coast with that one. Yeah. Aside from you, Joe, who's going with Saints? Uh, no, I'm going West no, Coast. Well, <laughs> West Coast. <laughs> well, that wraps up a, another show for another week, blokes. Another and excellent we, show. Another magnificent show. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks for listening. Uh, catch you again next week, same time. Well, if you want to like us on Facebook, Bound for Glory FM. Yes, yeah, it's, it's uh, facebook.com forward slash Bound for Glory FM. You can also follow us on Twitter at Bound for Glory FM. And check out Big Footy News as well as Sergeant Supercoach on Twitter. Thanks a lot, guys. I guess we'll see, see you, you next week. Talk Big to you next week. Footy. See ya. Cheers.